My name is Carolyn Gould. I'm president of the Chittenden County Historical Society. And um, we're going to have a short annual meeting uh, before this wonderful presentation by Elliot. Um, and I'll try not to speak super fast because I want to rush it along, but um, it, it's going to be very much abbreviated. If you're a member, you can vote. If you're not, please don't, but I'm not going to go around and check credentials uh, at all. For those of you who don't know us, we are an all-volunteer organization that is content-driven. That means we don't have a museum, we don't have artifacts. What we do is we deal in ideas. So we fund people uh, to do research, we publish articles in our bulletin, and we um, occasionally publish books. And we haven't for a while, but that doesn't mean we won't in the future. That could change. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we've got some new people on the board with good ideas. And um, so, our organization really relies on member dues in order to make these grants and put on presentations. And they, these presentations can vary in size from 10 people to 200. So we really never know how many people show up at any one thing. And because today it's sunshine, who knows what that means. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to do this very short annual meeting. And the reason we're holding it here in October is that we usually hold it in July. We try to sort of make, we've had it often at the Ethan Allen so we can have it outside. And this year we were unable to do that because in March we experienced the sudden death of Sarah Dopp. Now many of you probably knew her. Uh, Sarah was a fixture in the um, Vermont history scene for ever since she was probably in high school. She's a graduate from UVM. Uh, she was president of the Vermont Historical Society. She held virtually every position in this organization. She founded the South Burlington Land Trust and was a supporter of many, many, many more organizations. So her sudden death was a huge loss for a lot of people and everyone was sort of left scrambling to fill her shoes. She was our treasurer at the time mm -hmm. of her death and because she had done this for so long she, none of this information had really been updated in a while. So it's been kind of a long haul to get things together. So we couldn't really do a treasurer's report until we could get access to all of these documents. So you're now experiencing our July annual report in October. But the information in the annual report, which is available for you um, over there if you'd like a copy, um, that's why you're getting it. So the first order of business is to call this meeting to order. May I have a motion? I'm calling the meeting to order at um, 2.05. Second. Thank you. And um, I'd like to introduce Joe Perron. Just summarize the last meeting's minutes, please, and then we'll just vote on them. Just yeah, I, I didn't actually realize I was getting Oh, OK. <laughs> so I'll summarize them. At our last meeting, which was at Ethan Allen Homestead, uh, we had um, Rolf Diamant, a um, historian who was one of the directors of the Billings um, Museum and National Park, and he was talking about the backdoor war and the Civil War and the Vermonters' role in it. And he had to cancel at the last minute because the river <laughs> outside his house was rising. And then as he's talking, he agreed to do it via Zoom, and he calls me back afterward and his whole basement was flooding out. So it was quite a, a, an event. And we were going, gee, it's raining a lot. And then it just kept raining and raining. So that was the ninth. The following day, right. all hell broke loose for two days. So that was quite a, a thing. Anyway, it was a great occasion nonetheless, even though we had half the people at the museum and half the people on Zoom. 
Um, so I've talked about this year of transition, and one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this specifically is that next year, 2025, is our 60th anniversary. And we're going to plan a lot of things around it. We're just in the planning stages now. We hope to do an expanded bulletin. We've done that on the 20th and the 40th. Um, and also, we're bringing in younger people, much younger than I am, and um, with new ideas. And we want to digiti digitize our bulletin that we publish anywhere from four to six times a year and make that available online for people. There's lots of good articles in there. And lots of other things, and maybe set up some special scholarships. So it's stuff to look forward to. So in this case, uh, this year has caused us to um, rethink some things and maybe put some new feet forward. Um, the treasurer's report, many of you have, but most of the board has seen it and already approved it. If you want to take a look, I need a motion to um, both a motion for the secretary's report to be approved and seconded. For the I second. Who did? <laughs> More the Allens second. collectively. The Allens collectively made the motion and seconded. Sure. <laughs> And for the treasurer's report, as it stands? So moved. Second. second. Judy seconds. And um, there is a membership report in there as well. We sort of held our own. We're looking to grow. So talk to your neighbors, friends, strong arm people, whatever. As I said, your, most of your money will go to supporting people doing research, like Elliot. Um, I was going to have Gail Rosenberg give a special report on the um, newly planned Burlington History and Cultural Center. How many of you have heard of that? About half. So I'm going to give a summary. They now have a website. I think it's bhcc.org or something like that. Um, if you pick up uh, an annual report, the information is in there. They're now in the process of doing a feasibility study for it. The reason I bring it up at this annual meeting is that we acted as its um, fiscal agent, which meant while they were seeking to become an established 501c3 organization, we um, acted as their banker, so to speak. And so they were raising funds in order to find out what kind of museum do people want, or do they want a museum, or do they want a digital museum, or what are people looking for, and what do they want to see, and who do they want to see represented. So it is still on the planning stages, and there is a SurveyMonkey site you can go to and put your ideas known. The, the email address is also in the annual report. Um, so, That's I, Burlington History and Culture Center dot com, actually. Thank you. <laughs> Burlington History and Culture Center dot com. Written out and. Written out and, yeah. So, we'll see. Uh, I think something's going to happen, but I'm not sure what. And it's your opportunity to put your two cents in. How often do you get a chance to do that in the planning stages? Not very often. So I would like a motion to dispense with old business, if someone would make a motion. So moved. Second. So we're dispensing with uh, old business. We really only have one um, item on the agenda for new business, and that is the approval of the slate of officer, or board members and officers. And again, in the annual report is the list. I would ask everybody to stand up, but 
uh, not everybody's here. <laughs> a number of people are on vacation. When did October become <laughs> vacation month, by the way? It's got warmer. Warmer. <laughs> when we got invaded by leaf peepers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. that's the that makes sense. Sure. And then hotter too. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it's quite cozy this week. So, wow. Anyway, so three people are on vacation, <laughs> and since we moved the date, this is what happens. Um, in addition to me, uh, we have uh, as vice president Lisa Evans, who was a, a president before. You, some of you may know her, Joe as secretary and historian of the organization. A new board member, Elizabeth Allen, who is also a recipient of one of our research <laughs> grants and who also has been published in the bulletin. Cheyenne Stokes, who is, who is not here, but she's going to be involved in all outreach, as is Judy Allard, who has been a member for quite some time at this organization and who provides the best cookies ever, so be sure to eat them. <laughs> I can smell them from over here. Through the mask. And they yeah. look like they came from the bakery because they're all perfectly sized, but trust me, she made them. Oh. Um, <laughs> Jeff Hindis, who is a history teacher, who is not here. And he works on membership and a lot of other things. Um, we currently do not have publications staffed. But if we decide to publish a book, we will do that. Our bulletin members live quite a ways away, and they often are not available here. That is Barbara Bosworth and um, her husband, Tim Clemens, who are both reporters. And she uh, is a graduate of the UVM Historic Preservation Program. Um, Jane Williamson, Jane. Jane has now taken over our research grants uh, program. Yay. Um, Kathleen McKinley Harris has been a member of this board for a long time. I think she's in ill health at, at this point, mm -hmm. which is really sad. We need to follow up on that. Um, and John Thomas, who's in the back, also a new board member, <laughs> who's deciding where he's going to make his mark. <laughs> uh, as you can see, if you pick up this, we have a lot of vacant spots, so we're always looking for new people to join us and be on the board. We meet in Winooski every other month, so it's not a huge commitment of time. And if you're new to it, doesn't matter, I'll put you to work. <laughs> Believe her. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I am going to give this up. I'd like a motion to adjourn the meeting. Do we have a we don't, we don't well, have to approve the slate. The slate. Oh, sorry. Can I move? Yes. I'll move. Second. Okay. Uh, all those in favor <laughs> of adopting the slate of candidates? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Aye. 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 Thank you. Arr. <laughs> Arr. <laughs> Arr. <laughs> uh, I'm going to allow Elizabeth, who just started as program director and doing a bang-up job, um, to introduce our speaker and... Um, I'd love to talk to all of you afterward. And here we go, Elizabeth. Hi, everybody. My name is Elizabeth Allen, and I'm the new head of programming for Chittenden County Historical Society. And um, I'm introducing today's presenter. So our presenter is Elliot Lovrock. I'd probably mispronounce that a little bit. Lothrop. 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 Okay. Right. So he's the president of Building Heritage LLC, which um, does historic building preservation and timber frame timber framing, and that's located in Huntington, Vermont. Um, today's presentation is um, actually sponsored by a CCHS research grant. So Elliot received a CCHS research grant in 2023 to do this research. And so today he's going to be telling us about um, the land purchases and accumulation of the Whitcomb family in Chittenden County in the second half of the 19th century. And, his, and that kind of accumulation focused on um, Moses' ownership of the monitor barn and other iconic structures 
that were built by Charles Miller. So this is a follow-up and an expansion of an earlier presentation that Elliot did, and we're thrilled to have him back to uh, tell us more. So please, Thanks, take it away. Uh, awesome. Well, welcome. Uh, yeah, I've uh, presented uh, on the barn several times. This is a slightly different presentation for me. Um, in previous iterations, this has been more about the work that we've done. Uh, my company uh, and others have done a bunch of work on the barn and uh, been able to kind of just describe the work that we've done. Uh, and this is uh, the accumulation of a bunch of research that I've done, thanks uh, in part to the grant from you all. Uh, and it's morphed over time. It started as uh, an endeavor to learn more about Charles Miller, the builder of the barn, uh, but also in the process, uh, really delving into the Whitcomb family uh, who were responsible for this, this massive accumulation of land and uh, the massive barn. Um, we'll get back to this picture. You'll see it again and we'll talk more about it. I did want to go back to, sorry, I jumped in uh, well, um, while Carolyn was talking because I realized that I was the only one that was going to be uh, projecting here and I want to include a picture of Sarah Dopp. Um, mm -hmm. I've got uh, incredible admiration for uh, preservationists who uh, walk the walk, uh, and uh, Sarah was definitely one of those folks. Uh, I was fortunate enough to meet Sarah, um, I don't know, I was probably like a 27-year-old contractor or something like that, had only been in the business for a little while, and Sarah uh, had a lot of faith in my, my, uh, my craft and my ability and hired me to do the work on uh, Betty Mandel's house that she had recently acquired. Uh, just tremendous woman. Um, can't say enough good things about her and was heartbroken when I heard the news. So um, I'll try not to get choked up before I talk. Uh, so anyhow, as uh, anybody who's uh, heard me talk about this before and, and perhaps some of you, uh, some others know, um, and maybe you've guessed, I've got this uh, extreme attraction to the barn. Uh, part of that stems from uh, when I first came to Vermont. I attended the University of Vermont for grad school for historic preservation, uh, 2001 to 2003 and uh, had this, uh, this handsome young man down here that I uh, perhaps foolishly uh, got a junior year in college, uh, came to grad school in Burlington and quickly realized that there's nowhere to live in Burlington with a dog. Uh, and I had this notion that it'd be really nice to live perhaps on a farm with a farmer who had a trailer maybe and I could do 10 hours of work a week uh, in exchange for rent perhaps. And there were bulletin boards around that had lists of people like that, but nothing came through. So I was driving back to New Hampshire, uh, somewhat forlorn, and uh, drove by this place. And uh, there was a sign outside that said Vermont Farm Bureau. It was a Saturday. Happened to be somebody in the office. Tim Buskey, the director of the Farm Bureau, was there. He said, hey, do you have a list of people like this? He said, well, no, not really. But we have this milk house. And there's someone in it now, but they'll be out in August. <laughs> I was like, what? how do you feel about dogs? We love dogs. I was like, oh, my goodness. Uh, so then uh, summer in between, I uh, took a timber framing course, introduction to timber framing at Hartwood, which is in Western Mass. Uh, I was telling everybody I was really interested in barns, learning about timber framing. Everybody said, Jan Lundowski, get in touch with Jan Lundowski when you get to Vermont. Um, so a little bit of time went by. I worked in a different timber frame shop for a little bit. Cold called Jan Lundowski, who said, oh, it's great that you should call. I actually have a project coming up in Richmond working on the monitor barn. Um, I was 22 years old, living in the structure for uh, a couple months at that point. And I said, what's a monitor barn? And he's describing <laughs> the roof line to me. And I was like, holy smokes, I think I live there. Uh, and so. <laughs> They had dismantled this barn, and it was actually in pieces over here. This is the West Monitor Barn. Uh, apologies. This is the West Monitor Barn. It was dismantled in pieces uh, because it was actually moved just uh, a little bit, and it was over here. They were doing the restoration, and Jen, uh, being just an amazing person, hired me, and I got to do just a little bit of timber framing um, uh, on, on the structure. So um, anyhow, that's back. I could go on more about that, uh, but we're going to learn a little bit about Charles Miller. and. Um, as Elizabeth mentioned, this is um, it's a story of sort of land acquisition, uh, generational wealth and loss, uh, and sort of, I don't know, lots of different interesting things. And it's a story which I think has a lot of, uh, I don't know, it ties itself together really well, and I'm still sort of exploring all of it. So kind of bear with me as, I, as I'm working on kind of crafting where it all goes. Um, but the Miller family uh, starts in, in North Ferrisburg, uh, so Simeon Miller. Uh, Elder Simeon Miller is the early, earliest uh, Miller in North Ferrisburg. He has a son also named Simeon Jr. His son is S.S. Miller, Sheldon Simeon Miller, which would be Charles Miller's father. Uh, and so the family farmstead is here. There's a, apparently a brick farmhouse that's there. 
long gone. That's uh, at where Lewis Creek crosses Route 7 in North Ferrisburg. Um, yeah, sorry, that is no why. And it's actually, it's, uh, uh, you'll see on the Beers map, it's a road that no longer exists even. Uh, I haven't driven there to see it, but it's a road that no longer exists just uh, west of Route 7. Um, so uh, Sheldon Simeon Miller built the cover bridge on Old Hollow Road in North Ferrisburg, um, which was built around 1855. It's a town lattice cover bridge. You can see the town lattice inside here um, in, oh, sorry, that's kind of kicked off there. Um, I don't think there'd be a whole lot of slides like that, but in 1850, or sorry, uh, in 1958, the bridge was moved to Route 7. This is the bridge that's at the Vermont Flannel Company, uh, company along Route 7. Uh, I don't have a current picture of it, but you can see it here being moved by uh, Emile Desitel, um, who was quite a character from what I've heard, uh, and, and moved uh, the barn around the corner several, several miles. And uh, just for orientation, we'll come back to this as well, but uh, young Charlie Miller, uh, this is where his house is located. It's still there. It's at the corner of Mount Philo Road and Old Hollow Road in North Ferrisburg. Uh, and this little cool concrete post here still says C.C. Miller on it. Uh, his father, Simeon uh, uh, Sheldon, uh, also built Cover Bridge at Rockydale in Bristol. Uh, no longer there, of course. This is uh, the northern uh, bridge. I believe that there were two at that point as well. Uh, and Charles would go on to actually repair the same bridge that his father built about 80 years later, uh, another town lattice. Cover bridge, you can see the, the lattice through there. Where's that in Bristol? So that was at Rockydale. Um, so that's going to be uh, right where the church is, just north of the village. Um, there's a, I believe this was then replaced by a concrete bridge, which was then lost, I think, in the, in the 27 flood or maybe a, a subsequent flood. Um, and so I won't, uh, I, I like to put a lot of information on my slides, and if you can read this, feel free. If anybody wants a copy of this afterwards, I'd be happy to send it to them. Uh, most of this is, well, all of this is from Gene Richardson's History of North Ferrisburg, um, but it's a really interesting account of land acquisition. Again, Miller's family is there sort of through the beginnings of North Ferrisburg, um, builders throughout. His father dies, Simi uh, Sheldon Simeon dies at age 57 in 1877. Uh, so his, uh, Charles' mother, Rosala, is 56 years old when her husband dies. She's the mother of nine children, running a big house, vegetable gardens, poultry flock, and handling all the farm accounts. But it's 1877. Uh, her husband has no will and uh, she's considered the property chattel of uh, her husband and has limited legal rights. So basically loses all of her land, can't even uh, be the guardian of her son. Uh, her, the next oldest son above, above Charlie Harley, has, uh, he's married and has a child uh, and is still appointed a guardian because his mother um, cannot somehow be his guardian. Anyhow, um, and uh, so moving on from that, he uh, marries Belle, Sorrell of, of Shelburne, in 1886 at age 22, and uh, goes on to build his home, which we'll go back to. Um, so the first, so he builds a bunch of barns, builds a bunch of houses. We've got sort of limited accounts of sort of early Charles Miller construction and where they might be and whether any of them still exist. But the first really big building he builds is what's now called the Jubilee Barn in Huntington. Uh, so he's 29 years old when he builds this thing. And he builds it for Ansarella, Remington Randall, and Samuel Randall in Huntington. Uh, and so this is still there. I'm sure most folks know the structure. Uh, it's got this amazing high drive ramp out back. It's a bank barn. This is like very similar to the East Monitor Barn. Uh, bank barn built into the hillside with the gable end built into the hillside. So you can bring your hay in here on the high drive ramp. Uh, this is loose hay that you're, you're pitching with pitchforks through the loose hay down to the hay mow, which is down in this level. So the entire barn from this level up is sort of filled with hay on the sides. Uh, and then you can pitch your hay down to the cows below, which would be on the stock level, which is, is uh, at, at the street level on the front side. Um, it's very similar to East Meyer Barn, not totally the same, but, but uh, a lot of similarities. And uh, a couple built-in corn cribs on the back side, and beautiful little cupola for ventilation, and really heavy ornamentation on the, uh, on the farmhouse as well. Some great pictures of that. And uh, so here's Ansarella and Samuel J. Randall. Um, Samuel Randall was a veteran in the Civil War. Ansarella comes from a, a farm family from Starksboro. 
uh, that then moves to Huntington. Sorry, no, this, they always started. They were always in Huntington. Sorry, Sammy moves from Starksburg to Huntington. Apologies. Um, in the process of all this research, we were fortunate enough to come across this uh, this gentleman, Adam White, who is, I believe, he's the great great grandson of Charles Miller. Uh, found myself and Gene Richardson through uh, some Facebook posts about Charles Miller and everything, and said, "Hey, I've got these workbooks from Charles Miller," uh, and we were fortunate enough to get. This is the 1895. Uh, workbook from Charles Miller, and you can see up here, uh, and Gene is absolutely amazing, really good at reading cursive, which I am not, and had gone through and had listed all the names and had sent me a list of all the names that she had come across in this, and she actually uh, was assuming that this was suggesting that Randall uh, was actually an employee, uh, and I said, well, you know, can we take a closer look at it, look at the year and everything, and in fact, this is S.J. Randall, and this is, uh, an, oops, sorry, this is an accumulation of uh, the hours worked uh, building the barn, um, Mr. Miller building the barn for Samuel Randall. Um, so again, this is a lot of info here. Um, won't go through it all, but again, just talking about sort of land acquisitions. So Josh, Joshua Remington is the first Remington to come to Huntington. He then uh, deeds the land uh, to his son, Jeremiah, who has built the brick farmhouse that's there with local clay to build the bricks and everything. Uh, Jeremiah then deeds the the um, the land to Philemon, and then Philemon sell his son Philemon. Philemon then sells it to Samuel Randall and his daughter Ansarella Randall Remington. Uh, very interesting. Uh, Ansarella uh, maintains her name Remington Randall kind of throughout, and that family has a really uh, strong uh, presence of of women uh, throughout, which is is. Uh, is Quite interesting. The present owner, Sarah Jane Williamson, um, uh, I had a great conversation with her the other day when I stopped in here to take pictures, and she made a point of making sure that that part of the history is known. Um, and uh, so, yeah. Then again, it's it's her marriage to to Samuel and sort of this this combination of uh, agricultural uh, farm families that sort of takes things to the next level to where they're able to build this the, hire Miller to to build this massive barn. So here's Samuel with a loaded, loaded wagon of loose hay. Early picture of the barn, perhaps a Samuel out in front. Uh, another interesting uh, thing that was going on at the time uh, is a lot of larger farmers were getting into uh, working on, on coming up with cooperative creameries within their towns. Uh, so there was already things like Borden's condensed milk uh, that were in here that were national conglomerations that were sort of middle people that were siphoning money away from the farmers, what have you. And um, folks were starting to realize that and saying, hey, how can we start to come up with cooperative creameries uh, around the corner? So uh, Samuel does that, uh, then leases it to the Green Mountain Creamery Corporation, which I believe was in Worcester, Vermont had several sort of small regional creameries around. Um, and yeah, so, you know, 29 years old, Charles Miller builds this barn. Also on his 29th birthday, uh, he lays the sills for his house. So this is the house, still, the concrete pillar is still there. Uh, I was realizing on the way here, and I gotta, I gotta do a little bit more math to figure this out. I think that perhaps one of the reasons why Miller's story speaks to me so much is that I think that he and I probably suffer from some of the same sort of uh, motivation and drive. Um, I think that I actually laid the sills for our house uh, around my 29th birthday as well. Um, I think it may have been right around that. So anyway, I gotta go back. I'll get back to you on that one. Um, but I have similar issues. Um, so, uh, he, and this is remarkable, he builds, uh, so this is, uh, you know, from a newspaper article that he laid the sills on his 29th birthday. That's, I think it's July 11th. Um, well, I won't go back to it, but it's July 11th. He is moved into the house by the fall. Um, just remarkable time frames. Uh, so, that's the Randall Remingtons in, in Huntington and Charles Miller. Now, meanwhile, in 1896, uh, a county away in Richmond, this gentleman, Moses Sheldon Wickham, and he gets married in November to his second wife, Josephine Glenn Fuller. Miller, or sorry, Miller, uh, Wickham is 53 years old and Josephine Glenn Fuller is 18. Um, it's not entirely clear, obviously, well, it's not clear at all how they met. <laughs> I have no idea because I can't actually find anything about that. So I don't, I'm, I, I, very cautious, you know, I don't want to be making any suppositions about anything here. But the interesting thing about all of this is that uh, Josephine's mother is Sarah Ann Randall, 
who happens to be the sister of Samuel. Uh, so a little hard to see right here, but this little drop down is all siblings. Um, so you can see Samuel Randall, Sarah Ann Randall, uh, right here, who is the mother of Josephine. Glenn Fuller marries Moses Sheldon Wickham. His second marriage, they then go on to have three children. But he's 53 years old and has no kids. Uh, it's his second marriage. Um, so the Wickham family. So Lorenzo Wickham is the first Wickham to, to show up uh, on any maps. It is the 1857 Walling map. And you can see up here in the corner, he, there's actually two two little homesteads listed on that walling map. And you all know that, that you know, usually on the walling maps, those little dots are actually representative of a, of a house, of a homestead. Um, I don't know what that means. There's also, there's a lot of different um, misinterpretations perhaps, or interpretations. I don't want to assume that my, I would be happy to have anybody fact check me, but there's been different, lots of different investigations and reports written over time. A lot of them include uh, this name, Manuel, who is right here and that he owned a horse farm and that uh, Lorenzo actually bought his horse farm. My, what, I'm, what I believe is actually that uh, Wickham, and I need to do some actual deed research to figure out what the property transfers here, but that Wickham actually bought the property that was the Edmonds, the center at Edmonds um, farmstead and that the Manuel property was, was next to that. Uh, but anyhow, uh, Lorenzo, builds whatever he builds, starts acquiring some land and everything. It's his brother, Uziel Wickham, that really kind of starts acquiring a lot of land. So he buys land from his brother. He buys land up here. He buys land there. He buys land in Jericho, uh, Waterbury, really building up a lot of, uh, a lot of farmland. Um, now, this is an interesting picture. Uh, need to do more investigation on this to really determine uh, exactly what we're looking at. But I, I kind of overlooked this at first. So uh, one of the things that is we've been really fortunate uh, with is it, that the Richmond Historical Society maintains a collection of Wickham family photos. Both of the farmhouses were burned, uh, or burned, weren't were burned, uh, burned in the 1980s, I believe, the one associated with West Monitor Barn and this one associated with East Monitor Barn, although not completely. Uh, but somehow, somebody in Winooski was cleaning out an apartment and started opening up photo albums and realized that they were looking at the Monitor Barn and that they were looking at the Wickham family photo albums and got them to the Richmond Historical Society. So anyhow, um, I was kind of, I had scanned a bunch of them in and got copies of them uh, and kind of overlooked this photo at first. Uh, but I believe that this is the farmhouse associated with East Monitor Barn, and we'll go on to kind of look at that a little bit more, which would mean presumably uh, that this part of it here, at least the main part of the farmhouse, would be the birthplace of uh, Senator Edmonds, who is I think the third longest sitting senator of, of Vermont, uh, responsible for uh, a lot of great things at the time. Uh, and just a lot of articles about um, to what comes around, but this was an interesting one. I have no idea if this is what then actually brought Uziel to Richmond, but there's a, a fire in Waterbury in 1881 at a property where he loses a farmhouse, barns, hay, wheat, um, and it's right around the time period when the farmhouse was, was sort of dressed up, but I have no, um, no idea when he really came to be there. Um, but somewhere around 1880, Uziel puts a bunch of money into the farmhouse, builds this west wing here, this west addition, and then just goes to town with the Italianate fenestration details. Um, really fun detail here that um, easier, easier to describe probably to a house or a room full of uh, historians than to uh, show a bunch of pictures. But uh, the foundation right here, across here is redstone, the current conditions of this building. Current conditions are, this is redstone right here. Right here, there's a really awkward transition from redstone to regular fieldstone. And it's not, it's nothing a, a mason would ever do. It's like there's just a running joint straight down and it's sloppy. And then from there, that way, it's all fieldstone. And my belief is that they, when they did this, the, the whole Italianate, you know, dress up here and everything, that they just replaced the front of the foundation with redstone. The rest of it's behind the porch and you never see it. You know, every, we, we know that this is sort of, it's all about what it looks like from the road. And uh, so again, exactly. And so again, this is, um, 
I'd, I'd really like to get in here at some point to open up the walls to actually figure out if any bit of this is original. Uh, but my belief is that the foundation is original at least and that part of this, some part of this is actually Senator Edmonds' uh, homestead. Uh, not to go off on a tangent too much about sort of misinformation or misdirection or whatever, but there's a, a picture of the farmstead uh, with the horse barn, which is way up in back, uh, which has also been mislabeled the carriage barn up behind uh, the monitor barn, but it says that that is the site of the birthplace of Senator Edmonds. But then people have then taken that to mean that actual location is where the, the homestead would have been, which doesn't make any sense. Route 2 was there in 1805, it was a turnpike. There's no world in which you would have had the ability to have a house right on the turnpike and then chosen to build the road 200, 300 feet away from it. Um, so I'm almost certain that Senator Edmonds' homestead would have been right here. I think that that is probably it, but that's a discussion for a different time. Um, so going back just a little bit in time, this is uh, Moses Sheldon Wickham's first wife, Lillian Genevieve Green. Um, so he's acquiring all this land. He's kind of moving up in the farm. His dad has built up all this land, transformed the house into this beautiful, beautiful Italianate structure. Uh, Moses Sheldon buys the farm from him in uh, 1886, gets married 1887 to Lillian Genevieve Green. You can imagine sort of dreams of, of grandeur and um, you know this, this dairy industry is just going to be huge. Seven months later she falls ill and dies. Um, and apparently it was a very horrific death. Um, I'm not exactly sure, it's some sort of tumor I think, uh, but just sounds awful. Um, so her father had passed away two years before, and I think sort of as was common at the time, uh, her mother was living with them, and she would go on to continue living with them after, uh, after Lillian died. Uh, her mother, Jane, would, would continue to live with Sheldon. Uh, and so, it was a really neat little article. In 1889, Sheldon moves to the village of Richmond and lets, leaves behind his, his 60 cow farm to Orrin Atwood. Um, and this is a really fun story for me because one of my dear friends and colleagues is this gentleman right here, Bill Atwood. Uh, and he had told me when he was working on the barn a year and a half ago that his grandfather was born in the house. And um, there's just many you know, different tales of things and it's hard to any, ever confirm anything. And um, so a couple weeks ago, I was doing some research on newspapers.com or whatever, came across this. Bill actually happened to be in the parking lot loading up his excavator. And I said, hey, do you, you know, are there any O names in your family? And he said, well, it was Oren. My, my grandfather was named Oren. And well, it turns out uh, this is Bill's great grandfather, moves in uh, March 1889. Just afterwards, uh, his youngest child, Frank Atwood, is born in the farmhouse. And that, sure enough, is Bill's grandfather. Um, <laughs> really, really cool. And Bill is just salt of the earth, amazing, amazing guy. Uh, this is a picture of them here. This is Bill and his son, Billy, uh, who are, they're removing uh, three levels. This is two levels here, and this is actually the third level of concrete slab from inside the monitor barn uh, so that we could do the restoration work. Um, just, yeah, wonderful little tidbit there. So uh, Wickham is living in the village of Richmond. Uh, his his mother-in-law passes away in 1893. Hard to really obviously say what's going through his mind, uh, but somewhere in there he gets reinvigorated perhaps in the notion of, of building this dairy farm up uh, and somehow meets Josephine in there, perhaps through Samuel in Huntington, perhaps through Charles Miller, who really knows? But uh, in 1896, he then marries, you can see right here, 53 and 18, he marries Josephine. Uh, they would go on to have three children. And five years later, Sheldon Whitcomb hires this man here, Charles Miller, to build a massive barn, 112 by 54 feet. Um, <laughs> Miller's building that barn, the monitor barn, at the same time as he's building two 40 by 100s. Um, one, one of those we're fairly certain has burned, the Squire Palmer one, uh, uh, but the Harrison Weller barn still exists, and we have some pictures later if, if folks want to see that. Um, and this is just, this is much later, um, a picture of Charles and, and Bell. Uh, I'm sure he is not 35 years old in this picture, but <laughs> he was 35 in 1901 when he had these three barns built, which is just mind blowing. Um, 
that just a little bit. A uh, newspaper article here, Sheldon Whitcomb has a force of men unloading slate at the Jonesville station to uncover one of the finest barns in Vermont. It will accommodate a dairy of 100 cows and more. Um, just a fun, fun little article. Uh, there's a guy in the back here, Jeff Spencer, who could tell you probably uh, what that uh, feels like uh, moving all that slate because he's responsible for reslating the roof here. Um, uh, and so, yeah, he, he just, uh, Sheldon just takes things to the next level here. Uh, you know, he's, he's obviously comes from a place where, you know, he doesn't have to worry about all his land acquisition. Uh, you know, he's, he's coming into something that's already established, but he's somehow got this vision to really take things to the next level. Um, I am, ass I've been assuming that this is him. This is Sheldon Whitcomb. Uh, don't really know. Doesn't quite look like he's in his fifties there and it's, impossible to say who Josephine would be. I don't see anybody who's like very, but anyhow, that's a really fun little photo. World's shortest tie. Uh, it's a funny one, right? Mary, Mary pointed that one out. I can't take credit for that, but uh, yeah, really fun little photo. Um, so also at the time, uh, probably a lot of folks know there's, you know, this uh, sort of transition in, in farming going from sort of early subsistence barns with really large siding with gaps between all the boards and lots of airflow through uh, to starting to tighten up barns. And in the process of that, they realized that cows would get tuberculosis if there's not enough ventilation. Um, so there are lots of state agricultural schools like the University of Vermont, but most of them out in the Midwest, Wisconsin um, was, was a big one that were studying the right amount of passive ventilation uh, that would uh, prevent tuberculosis, but also would m kind of maximize milk production. Uh, and so I kind of started in the 1880s. A uh, gentleman, F.H. King, wrote a book in 1905 about this, and this is uh, an illustration from the book. I think this is probably a cupola and not a full monitor ridge, uh, but it's still a very similar depiction of, of the passive ventilation system that, that the monitor barn has. Let's see how I'm doing on time. And uh, so skipping ahead in time a little bit, this is a, a fun photo that um, shows a lot of the property uh, that, that doesn't appear on, on any other photos. And um, so you'll see here is the milk house. There's a detached milk house. There's, there are two doors right here. Uh, there are, you can tell from some ghost lines inside on the ceiling that there was a separate little room in the very corner here. Uh, was either uh, for for health, bovine health, you know, maybe had uh, had some medicines in there, um, but I believe that that door to the side would have been for humans, and then the cows are coming in and out of that door to go to pasture, um, and then you know they're bringing loaded uh, milk jugs to the um, uh, to the milk house. There, uh, we've uncovered the foundation to that. It's this massive, massive concrete foundation, uh, which presumably is is kind of a cold sink to help keep the milk jugs cold. Uh, until they went to um, to the train or to the creamery. Uh, the other, another really neat thing that shows up here is the only photo that we have of it is the high drive ramp f for the barn. Uh, so you can see a giant stone abutment right here, just like you would have on a on a bridge. Mm -hmm. And then you can see just a little plank that goes across here. There's a couple uprights, uh, which suggests that there's some sort of cable or rope maybe as a railing that went across. Um, we can just imagine how that felt for the horses trying to go across this like crazy bridge up there and it's 20 feet down on the sides and um, where, is the, where is the access to that from the east or the west side to get to that ramp? To get to the ramp, uh, kind of from the north, from the end. So there's a road, I think it shows up on the aerial maps that you'll see later, but there's kind of a farm road that goes back here that's way higher um, than the existing road is now and that kind of wrapped around and then came into the barn from from that backside. Uh, apparently, that all existed until the 1976 flood. Uh, and at that point, they obviously were no longer farming with horses, but they had tractor implements. And at that point, they had begun storing their tractor implements up in the high drive. Uh, and when the high drive abutment and bridge washed away, all of their implements were stuck up there. And so they literally had to drag all of them to the doorway and then hoist them out with a crane. Um, <laughs> There's a wonderful gentleman who came uh, last year and gave us a bunch of, bunch of great stories. Um, so I think that there was probably initially a silo inside the barn, 
uh, square silo perhaps with, uh, with uh, 45 corners. Um, the earliest silos were square, but they realized really early on that it was really hard to get the silage out of the corners, and so it would rot, and so they went first to just putting a, a board at a 45 degree angle so you don't have any 90 degree corner. Uh, that then they went to octagons, and they quickly began you know, moving them outside and going to round. Um, this is the first exterior location of the silo, uh, but I believe it, it was located inside, just, just inside right there. Um, and, oh, all right, going the other way now. Don't have the exact way. So I'm including this photo again because um, this is the direction that this photo would have been taken from, would have been right here. And you can see how this west edition has this, it's off center. It's got this really long sloping roof on this side. And it's kind of, it makes this whole transition fairly awkward. And the reason for that is because it's built onto this addition here, but it's actually, or onto this main building here, but it's wider than, uh, and so you've got this, just this goofy roof angle that has to come out there. You can also see that there is a door here with a window above, uh, just a window there. Um, it's the same as this, only this is missing the, the porch. The porch has been removed. Um, so again, I'm like still trying to find some smoking gun evidence. I really need to get into the building to actually see, but I'm fairly certain that, that, um, that this early picture um, is that same home. So this is a fun one on the left here. This is going, going back in time here a little bit now. Um, and uh, this is the earliest picture that we've uncovered of, of the Monitor Barn. Uh, and I say that because there's no silo here. So the silo is presumably still on the interior. Uh, there's a corn crib and granary, I, I believe, here. And this is kind of an equipment shed, mechanic shed, um, and probably some cows in the barn along the side. You know, one of the interesting sort of things to think about is that Sheldon didn't build this giant barn and then go out and buy 100 cows. So he had 60 cows. Those cows were presumably living somewhere there, maybe accumulated the next 40 cows over that time period or what have you. Um, but presumably, there were barns there already to house large numbers of cows uh, that were no longer needed. Um, so these buildings here don't show up for very long. You know, you go back to this photo here, and there's just the remnants of one there, but nothing here remains. Uh, another fun little thing here, so you've got uh, milk jugs, milk cans in a sleigh. And you'll notice that on either side of this little patch of snow is mud. Uh, and so presumably, and this is very high exposure for sun and everything there, so presumably they were actually rolling the snow and actually packing the snow in along the driveway there to be able to continue uh, using a sleigh instead of a, instead of a wagon. Um, the other interesting thing is they're loading them up, presumably to go out onto Route 2 to bring them to Jonesville to the creamery, which would also mean that Route 2 would also be rolled. Uh, th at that time period, there was, a, there was a lot of sort of discussion in towns whether we were going to plow the roads or we we're going to roll the roads. And um, if you plowed the roads, you were sort of pushing everyone towards gentrification. Everybody needed to get along with the times and up with the times and get a car. Uh, if you plowed the roads, you couldn't take your sleigh on them. Um, so anyhow, interesting little bit there that it's, it's very intentional that they've, they've maintained that little bit of snow along there. Uh, and then, so jumping ahead on the silo a little bit, you'll see the second location of the silo here in the middle of the barn. You can see the sort of remnants of it here at the corner, um, sort of a little filler spout there and everything. Fun one too that kind of took a little bit to figure out the perspective on here, but this is a picture of the milk house with a flatbed truck in front of it. Um, so there's a door of the milk house, a little window there, and a flatbed truck in front of it. At first, it always looked like a bit of a carnival uh, truck or something like that. But um, So some more pictures. I, was, uh, I need to try to uh, track these down again, but these are photos that I got back in 2001 from the Farm Bureau. Um, and they haven't been able to. The Farm Bureau's been moving a couple times, and so I don't know where these photos are now, but need to put my hands on them again. Um, Interesting little bit here, we, we uncovered this doorway um, in the restoration process, and this photo demonstrates it really well. It's, it's kind of impossible to ever have that doorway uh, be high enough out of grade that it's not attracting water to the building. Um, it's kind of in a negative drainage area, and uh, you'll see some pictures later on, but the basement uh, level of the barn is pitched nearly two feet from back to front. Um, 
because everything rolls downhill. And my assumption is that what they were hoping for uh, to aid in that is that they're getting all the runoff of the roof, everything washing down, and it's actually coming into the building and helping them to wash out the concrete floor. That concrete floor that Bill and Billy Atwood were standing on is presumably the original concrete floor from 1901, which is really, really early for a concrete slab. Um, but the way in which it was poured, uh, it, it is um, almost certainly an original floor. Um, yeah, really neat detail. Uh, so also in that sort of diversification that I was talking about with Randall Remington's looking at creameries, uh, there is also attempts to keep milling more local. Uh, and so another little endeavor that Moses Sheldon Whitcomb undertook uh, was to own uh, Chittenden Mills from 1904 to 1906. You'll see here, Sheldon Whitcomb will soon open up the Chittenden Mills for custom work, custom milling of, of flour and grains, presumably. Um, neat little tidbit. And uh, similar to Samuel Randall, and Answell Remington, uh, he also had started a creamery just around the corner in 1896 in, uh, in Jonesville, uh, and then in 1915 gets together with a group of farmers in Richmond and endeavors on this Richmond Farmers Cooperative Association. And uh, he puts up, Sheldon puts up land that he owns. Uh, I don't know if folks know where the creamery used to be in, in Richmond. It's behind um, where the Blue Seal Feeds building is now. It's, it's since been uh, demolished. It's a brown fields, I think, for a little bit. And, uh, but Sheldon puts up the land for it, loans the cooperative the money, and also becomes the treasurer of the cooperative. Again, this one was more directly sort of combating Borden's, who I think was already established in Richmond um, and was just in this really, you know, uh, in a good sort of moment of trying to um, sort of uh, maintain all of that production in Vermont as much as possible and keep the value production here. So let's see. So you can see, this is the photo that I was talking about, the aerial. You can kind of see where the high drive ramp is here. So they're really bringing stuff around way in from the end. Um, and this road is way up high here. Just uh, interesting, you know, interesting aerial photos. One thing that strikes me about this one here, um, you know, so the Wickhams own both properties. I haven't really touched on the West Monitor Barn at all and the West Farmhouse at all. Uh, so the West Monitor Barn was pre presumably built in 1904. There's a big fancy farmhouse that goes with that as well. And it's really not clear to me where the Wick comes, where Sheldon actually lives and what they do with that house and what they do with the house that I've been showing you. Uh, later on, uh, Josephine and Mrs. Uh, Wickham goes on to, to board folks. As you saw, there's a tourist sign there. She's boarding folks in the, in the house that's over here on the east property, but it's not clear that they ever really live there. And it's kind of fun just looking at this photo, making a complete assumption here. But to me, this looks like a well manicured home property. And this, you know, you look at that massive amount of just open land where the cows are milling around, whatever, that just looks like factory production. I mean, there's a farmhouse there, but if I've got both of those, I'm, you know, I don't know, I'm thinking I'm living over at the West Barn and um, at that property and Got more of a factory over the East Barn. But anyhow, 1930s, uh, unfortunately, Sheldon makes some bad investments. I don't really know what those are. Loses a bunch of money. Um, and the interesting thing about so much of this is that it all follows sort of agriculture in Vermont, right? Straight through 19th, 20th century. This is how it went, right? Uh, land acquisition over time, build this giant barn. You know, we didn't even touch about why the barn doesn't actually, you know, it's this beautiful gravity feed barn, uh, but then they pass a Dairy Production Act that says well, you have to milk, you know, dairy cows have to be on a concrete floor. So they've got this whole level of the floor that's obsolete, uh, you know, and that's timed with westward expansion and people moving out of Vermont. Um, so it's just this, you know, classic story. Here we are in the 1960s. Um, as, uh, as I learned through some of this process, uh, you know, they go from... 1962, no silos here. 1967, they've got what are known as the big blue tombstones or the big blue bankruptcies. Um, so their salespeople are around, coming around selling these harvest stores. Apparently there's an issue with the diaphragms in them and they failed miserably. Uh, lots and lots of farmers 
went all in on these things, took out mortgages on their farms, and lost a lot of money. Um, so again, probably just one more part of the sort of fall with all of this. Um, An auction year, I went to a farm auction and was selling it was an advertising piece for Harvest Store. And he was an old cattle auctioneer and he said, these things cause more dispersal sales in the state of Vermont. I bet. Yeah, I, I never knew that until this. And I was kind of looking some of that up in preparation. And there's a, like a whole list of nicknames for these things. <laughs> Um, big blue banks over yeah anyhow um, so yeah neat uh, neat photo here uh, you can see the milk house uh, you know the attached milk house is still there uh, or is there um, here's the little horse barn that was an earlier horse barn we haven't really talked about this uh, this horse barn at all which we should right here I guess um, so this is the only really good historic picture we've got of it you can see down in the basement uh, there are two people doors on either side of a large opening I'm fairly certain that that uh, is representative of a piggery. Um, it's a sort of low basement in there, uh, and I think that the middle area would have been an open pig pen, and that you would have gone uh, into either side to um, to their contained areas to be able to feed them and access and everything. Uh, everything was just very intentional at this time period, uh, turn of the century. They're you know they had a plan, and every every part of the buildings had some function, uh, and so. The main bit of this, though, uh, the upper story is a horse barn. And uh, again, just um, interpretations of history and fact and all those things. This is recorded in, uh, in the National Register nomination as a carriage barn. And it's been repeated as a carriage barn throughout. And, and a couple months ago, or half a year ago, I started saying to people, hey, this really isn't a carriage barn. Like, There's no way in which you would have all these here, and there were the other barns back here. And you'd say, hey, I'm going to put my carriages and my fancy carriage horses all the way as far away from my house as I can. Uh, instead, what this was is actually for the draft horses. So this is a horse barn, and really not a carriage barn at all. Uh, and so there are draft horses that were in here. The foundation is, is quite mind-blowing back here. So there's a wing wall that goes to the west of the monitor barn carries behind the monitor barn, full two stories tall, continues right here, descends a little bit around the corner, and then is the same foundation for the back wall of the horse barn. Um, so what that process looked like, whether they did all the foundation at once, and then who knows? Uh, but it's, um, I think it's about 175 linear feet of, of stone wall that's all contiguous on the backside there. Um, so again, just really neat part of the, the horses were integral to this vision that, you know, Sheldon and maybe Miller had for how the farm was going to operate. Um, so again, just, you know, series of, of uh, misfortunes through the 20th century. Zen Wheeler uh, was sort of the name that a lot of folks associate with both barns uh, in the 80s and 90s. He was a big fan of the Farm Bureau, deeded uh, the land to the Farm Bureau in the 90s. And... Um, you can see the West Barn in its original location was eventually moved to right about here uh, on some um, land that uh, I guess it was the VYCC was given at that point. Can, can we go back? Yeah. Going back to the story of the harvest stores, on that photo, um, one of those is halfway down. Yeah. Do I see what that um, on the right hand side is? Yeah. That silo that's there yep. now? Yep. Yep. Exactly. Do you have an idea when that don't. I don't. I don't. There are some other photos from the 80s and 90s that I, I, I could probably look at. I don't know. Yeah, it's interesting. I hadn't noticed that the silo is shorter there on the left. And yeah, you can see it. So there's still the pad from a bunker silo. And then just last year, we removed all the sort of concrete uprights uh, for the bunker, bunker silo there. Uh, but again, another thing that sort of demonstrates these evolutions of dairying uh, throughout the 20th century. You can also see this massive uh, gravel pit that's been dug out back here that we've been kind of working on restoring a bit. Um, how are we doing on time? Folks, good? Yeah, you good? Great. Okay. Keep, okay. All right. Let's get up a little. Uh, so this is the horse barn. Uh, so ch -ch -ch -ch, this barn right here. So I moved in in 2001. The April before, well, that April, 2001, there was a, a series of, or March and April, the series of really heavy, uh, wet snow storms, three in a row, I believe. And uh, the roof on the horse barn collapsed. Um, I was, you know, early 20s, uh, kind of foolish guy, and uh, talked to the Farm Bureau, and they said, well, you can kind of have that frame if you want to clean it up and get rid of it for us. Um, so my good friend Jeff Ollinger and I dismantled the frame. I stored it there. 
uh, on the backside of where I was living for a little bit, and then actually had to hire a crane to help me move to Huntington, uh, stored in Huntington for a little bit, eventually went up for a garage uh, for ourselves in Huntington. Um, and here's the milk house. Um, so we'll just go through this stuff a little bit. So this is kind of into, more into kind of my time with the barn and everything. Um, and so you I, lived in the milk house. Yeah, yeah, I lived in the milk house, right? I uh, lived in the milk house. This was right before I moved in, I think. Uh, and so this connector was there, um, half falling in. Uh, I mean, it was an amazing place, but you'd, uh, you know, the rent was $400, but you'd turn the oven on and 20 minutes later it'd smell like mouse piss. Uh, <laughs> Maybe 10, yeah. Uh, the back side of the roof here was wide open. I, you know, as young carpenter, I couldn't, I couldn't quite figure out how to get up there and then how to like frame it out and then how to cover it with boards. So it was wide open and so you'd be hanging out in the living room and there'd be like a raccoon up there above you. And like, <laughs> so many bigs up there. Um, but it was cheap. Was that? The landlord was Farm Bureau. So yep. what's the transition from Whitcomb to the Farm Bureau? Uh, so Zen, so Farm Bureau uh, got it from Zen Wheeler. Uh, so there's, uh, sorry, there's this, uh, the Bono family owns it uh, first in the 37 to 45, and then, and then Zen Wheeler owns it, I guess, from 48, I think, right? Yeah, Xenophon, Xenophon Wheeler uh, owns it, I think, from uh, 48 until 97, something like that, until the 90s, and then he gives it to the Farm Bureau. He gives it. I believe so. Yeah. Clark Hinsdale and... Oh yeah, 93. And you know, he's telling the same, same story right here. Um, you know, it's age and elements take a toll. Um, I'm just kind of curious yeah. if people would actually rented that out. Like, would, would Richmond have like a certificate of occupancy on that today if they would allow somebody to live there? Like, or rent it? probably should not read this thing. Well, it's gone now. It's gone now. Uh, I don't think so. No, I could tell you. I can tell you other stories. <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, no one knew we were living there. No one knew we were living there. Uh, yeah, uh, but it was amazing, and obviously, uh, probably the reason that I am passionate about barns and passionate about this barns in particular. Um, you know, I was living there and was a student uh, at UVM for historic preservation. Tom Visser had just written his book a year or two before, uh, history of northern New England farm buildings, outbuildings, and on the cover is the West Monitor Barn with East Monitor Barn in the background, <laughs> and it's our textbook, I'm like, I bet that's my house, I'm like, like yeah, it's too cool. Um, so here's my friend Jeff Fellinger again, awesome, awesome guy, he's up in the Northeast Kingdom, does window restoration, uh, he was also a UVM grad school student. Um, so we'll just speed through this a little bit. So when I was in grad school, I worked for a guy named Jeremiah Beach Parker, who was down in Shoreham doing barn restoration. Um, worked for him for about a year and a half, two years, just kind of extension of graduate school, basically just learning to how to actually do the work. Uh, and then went off on my own in 2004, and one of my first jobs, uh, since I knew the folks at the Farm Bureau, was uh, to get to do a bit of stabilization on the East Barn. Uh, and so basically just covering stuff up right here, just you know everything you see here, all of that rot, just covering that up. Uh, and we'll describe what's going on here, but you can see how there's this incredible bulge right there, right? Um, and so, uh, basically, the monitor barn is two boxes. There's a box here, down, and a box there, up. Uh, and each one of those would kind of be a barn unto itself. It's platform framed, and, so, and there's a sill level. Uh, there's sills at this height. And so what that means is, is there are posts that are interrupted. So there are posts that go from there up, posts that go from there down. And this bit all has this, this tall foundation that I was talking about. And so over time, that slid downhill, heaving, gravity, all those things, and it pushed downhill. So it pushes this upper box downhill. The lower box stays put on the foundation, but the top goes with the upper box. So the whole thing was leaning about a foot, um, that lower, lower stuff. And um, so instead of trying to jack the building, and this is not my, maybe I would have gotten there eventually, but this is really Jan's. Um, Jan's notion, instead of jacking the building up and trying to roll it back uphill, jack the building up, hold it, and actually slide the lower bits towards the road to make it plumb. Um, so last summer, well, we endeavored on that task. Here's a little picture of the inside. Just popping around a little bit. These are the, uh, this is the high drive here, uh, and so you'd be pitching all the loose hay down here, and then there are doors on the back side of these chutes at all different heights. Every like three feet, there's a door. And so no matter what height the hay was at, you could stand on top of the hay, 
throw your hay down through the chute to the cows below. And then it also offered ventilation up through. Here's where the cows are. So there's, uh, there are six places where those chutes then, you know, dump through the ceiling down to the cows in this area um, where they would have, you know, there's stanchions here. There are also stanchions that are removed here with another set of gutters. So all the cows, there are uh, four rows of cows all face to face at the, um, at the hay chutes there. You have, you said there was, you said it was about 100 cows. Do you have any validation of what the number, of the size of the number of stanchions there, what their maximum capacity is? No, that's a good question. Um, we have some of the stanchions. It'd be easy enough to, yeah, it'd be easy enough to figure out. Uh, I'll have to get back to that. Yeah, we could figure out what that is because it's just one section and times uh, 36, I guess. Um, yeah, I'll get back to you on that one. Another interesting little tidbit here. Uh, you can kind of actually see it in this picture. The floor joists, they're all notched over the transverse sill here, and they all vary in, uh, in the height that sticks up above the sill so that it creates four valleys that run towards the gutter. So you can see here this floor is pitched towards the gutter. Mm -hmm. It's pitched towards the gutter there. It's because the floor joists are all cut at different heights to all shed everything towards the gutter. They could then shovel the manure through trap doors in the gutter here to sleds that were down in the basement, drag the sleds out with horses out to the fields and spread the manure on the fields. Uh, so this is jacking up the building last year. Uh, we had to replace the sill on the east side here. So there's a whole bunch of extra steel on that side um, just to accomplish that. Uh, and it ended up looking like this. this. This steel here is underneath the sill. Um, building weighs 500,000 pounds, uh, it's 4,000 pieces of cribbing, I think 128,000 pounds of steel I-beams to lift it up. Uh, we worked with uh, the Timber Framers Guild last summer. Um, we did a bunch of the timber work ourselves, but also brought in uh, volunteers and taught timber frame repairs. It's a really difficult thing to sort of learn if you're not... Um, you don't have the opportunity to work on that sort of stuff. Uh, so that was a really great process. We've been trying to kind of introduce all sorts of opportunities like this along the way, wherever we can. And I could, this is where my talk has been in the past. I could talk more about all this stuff. We're just gonna go through it quickly, but any, you know, anybody wants to know more about it, let me know. Uh, in moving the, that wall towards the road in order to make the wall plumb, uh, we had to pour a new concrete wall across the front and uh, we actually dismantled all the stones at the corner to slide those forwards a foot uh, so that the corners looked correct. Um, so we labeled all the stones, put on all the pallets, uh, extended on the eave sides there in order to uh, you know, bring the corner closer to the road and then relayed all the stones in exactly the same locations. You can see like uh, SE3W is this cool little smiley guy right here. <laughs> Uh, yeah, all back in the same spots. Um, worked with some really good stonemasons who were really patient with us in all that. Um, probably one of the coolest discoveries in everything is this guy right here. So that's the original granite threshold that was right there. Uh, you can see this trim piece right up above here was the original doorway in the middle. There was a window on either side. Uh, that had all been covered up with concrete. Everything had been completely reconfigured on that wall. And I came in one Saturday morning when Bill Atwood was there and he said, hey, I, I, we hit this thing on Saturday and you weren't here and I didn't know what to do, so I had to stop everything. And I was like, what are you talking about? And I looked down and this, this piece of granite, he was messing with me, of course, but he uncovered this piece of granite 14 feet long, two feet wide, and 14 inches thick. It's all hand split with, with wedges and feathers. Um, and so we're able to remove it, pour concrete, have the concrete set down at just the right height, so that is the height of the floor and threshold. Um, yeah, really fun, fun little discovery. Uh, and then all the stonework on either side is new with stone that we found on site, uh, made to rebuilt to look like it was original. Will you have to pull the top block? Uh, what you know, pull the bottom block one foot forward in a hundred years? I mean, not you personally, but you know what I, you know what I mean. No, sorry, say that again. The, well, you're talking about the fact that the building had kind of, like one of the blocks had slumped down, slumped downhill. As oh, the box. Moving, yeah, yeah, yeah. Moving, okay. Yeah. You move, the first, you move the lower box forward about a foot, right? Yes. So the base of it. Will that, will that need to be done in another? No. Story? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I should have picked up what you're saying better because you teed me up for my, uh, I could have done that so much better. Sorry. So, no, it won't. Uh, <laughs> well, you should ask. Well, you should ask. Yeah, we should do that again sometime. Sorry. 
<laughs> can do that better. Um, no, it won't. Uh, so in order to prevent that from happening again, we excavated the backside here. Uh, so this is the full stone foundation. So again, it goes down two stories. Uh, it's like 18 feet tall, three feet uh, thick up to the first story, and then two feet thick from there up. Uh, excavated the entire thing with this uh, sloping wedge shape and so there's a material called flowable fill that we poured in there so it's uh, like a low grade concrete um, has no like tensile strength to it at all it's just uh, got a ton of air and water in it uh, but it holds its mass it holds its shape really well so it's 384 yards of it so it's basically this entire thing is filled up with this concrete product uh, but will prevent any material from ever sliding down and then being able to push against the wall. Um, the goal is to, we created what's called a gravity retaining wall. So it's a wall that can act as a retaining wall without ever having any horizontal pressure put against it, um, which is why it failed before. Um, yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, and this is how we accomplished it. There's insulation, there's a vapor barrier. I won't go into all that, but uh, and then this is this year's work. Uh, this year we've been uh, working with Jeff Spencer back here. Started back in April, I think, removing slate. Uh, our crew has been going through, investigated. We had to remove all of the roof sheathing to figure out, you know, which beams are rotted. You know, there's top plates that are rotted. There's sections of purlin that are rotted. Tons of rafters that are rotted. Um, so, in order to replace the beams, you got to take off the rafters and um, yada yada. So, uh, really doing a deep dive in all that stuff. Um, fun little detail here that both this barn and Jubilee barn share. This is actually a turnaround for the horses. So this is all the way on the route two end of the barn up in the high drive. And uh, so the way it was originally, this was headed off right here. And Miller's design was to have the load spread to two sort of main beams or struts. So, you know, as this roof weight is loaded up here, it's sending its load out to there. Um, issue, of course, there's nothing restraining that, so it can just actually spread and push things apart if it wants to sink. He also didn't put a post here, same sort of thing, tried sending the load out there. Anyhow, bringing things up to code just doesn't work. It's a lot easier for us just to say, all right, we're going to leave everything that's original, scarf in a new post to bring the load all the way down to the beam, just like everywhere else, um, but still able to leave the remnants of, of his intended design there. Um, and here's some fun stuff from up high. Again, just lots and lots of time, 70 feet up in the air in a, in a lift. Very hot this summer. Um, uh, did, maybe you touched on this, but I didn't. So did Charles Miller learn barn building like from his father? Who, who did he learn under? Because this is very complicated. Yeah, I, I wish I knew. I mean, it's his, you know, his father was building bridges, um, but he was only 11 when his dad died. His uncle, I don't know how old, how long his uncle, his, his uncle was also a bridge builder. Um, but there's, yeah, I haven't come across anything that's like he learned it from such and such. Um, uh, and, I, you know, he built the Rancel, uh, Randall Remington barn when he was 29 years old. I mean, I'm making an assumption that he was the lead builder in that. We've got the work journal, uh, but I don't know if there was also somebody else uh, that was sort of a mentor to him or if even Samuel Randall was helping him with some of that. So that's uh, another bit of information hopefully to uncover. Great question. I have a question about the, the yeah. barn building. Um, yeah. You were talking a few slides back about how the way that that corner was built, the, the weight of the roof was just, could have just contributed to spreading and, mm -hmm. you know, collapse. So I was wondering, um, what you know? Do you have any evaluation of the quality of the barns that were built, or how 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 frequently would you see something like this that was like not an optimum construction? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, you, you know, like, can you talk a little bit more about? I guess the, the quality of the barn. Yeah, no, for sure. That's a great question. Yeah, so, you know, this is turn of the century, and so it's a time period where things people are moving away from timber framing in general, uh, and he's actually starting to, you know, things are starting to become more uh, regular. So, you know, studs are two foot on center. You know, they're starting to move not towards sheet goods, but things are becoming a little more regular. Whereas before things are spread out, you know, you'd have a 40 foot long barn and you just have, you know, 20 rafters spread out throughout and they might be three foot two on center or some random number. Um, but, and so they're moving towards smaller timbers, you know, before you'd have really large hand and stuff or whatever. And so they're really like maximizing the ability of wood uh, with as sort of minimal amount of wood as possible. 
um, but it's still authentic timber framing. So it's it's kind of the perfect um, parts of all worlds. The you know we've we've worked on a couple of Miller's barns, and um, the the thing about them is they're really well engineered, really well thought through, uh, but only if all of the pieces and parts of the barn are able to do their work. And so as soon as you get differential settlement, where you get like one post sinks differently than another post. All of a sudden, it's yeah, it's soon as time, yeah. It started saying, you know, I don't think you know Miller is great, but he never conceptualized that this box was going to move differently than that box, you know. Um, and so we've done a lot of uh, putting steel rods. Like there's the top plate. Uh, you know, the, these rafters are always going to spread the walls. Uh, you know, there there were three different iterations of attempts to keep that from happening, and we we're working on the fourth one right now, which I th I think is much better. Um, but there's these these diagonal rods that go in right here. Um, and again, it's, you know, if everything was perfect, you might not need those. Uh, but as soon as one thing settles, it's just too much, uh, load always goes to, uh, to stiffness. And so as soon as one thing falls off, that load is going to search for something else that it can send its, its weight down to. Um, so yeah, uh, all to say he's, you know, and this is, again, this is also a time period. I didn't really touch about, touch on this at all, but, um, and Miller is kind of a master builder, so you know it was kind of a thing to know, like the Pythagorean's theorem. Uh, if you if you knew that, you were ahead of a lot of people. And so Miller is probably not actually building the barns, but he's doing the layout of timbers, and he's overseeing a crew of people who are. But he's got this sort of elusive knowledge that lots of other folks don't have. Um, anyhow, there's so many more parts to all of that. We, and another part of all of this, which I didn't really touch on, what I should touch on here is for me. Part of this story, uh, the big part of the story, which is so neat, is to know Charles Miller and to know his name. Um, it was only like a year and a half ago or something like that, that that even came up that this was discovered that Charles Miller built the barn. And I'm always, as a barn builder, I'm always struck by how many folks think that farmers build barns. Um, nothing against farmers, farmers, amazing folks and everything, but. Uh, there's so much, you know, engineering, geometry, uh, construction skill involved in all of this that it's, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it shouldn't be a concept that uh, a farmer could build a barn like this, right? And so to know that, you know, we know the builder. Within that, of course, like Charles Miller didn't actually probably build the barn, so there were actually other people who were toiling away uh, whose names we don't know. But again, it's just an, you know. There are things which say Wickham built the barn, Randall built the barn. Neither of those guys built anything. You know, Miller maybe built the barn or lent a hand in building it at least. So anyhow, just um, it's always important to me the stories that we kind of uh, that, you know we take away from these things. Would you call him an architect? Uh, no, just a builder. Well, yeah, maybe builder architect. I mean, it's yeah, it's kind of a because I think at that point there were straight up architects. Before that, maybe there were like the builder architects, and, and so, uh, yeah, that's a great question, though. I don't know. I'll get back in on that one. <laughs> George, you have some? I was just uh, commenting as far as when you look at the amount of work that's done here, they're going to see in the future Elliot built the bar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm just a, just a cog. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> uh, um, well, I don't know. Uh, do you guys want to leave? Uh, just real quick, uh, one other barn I can show you. Yeah. It's sort of about the economics of late 19th century Vermont driving this, because you've got the specialization, which is creating excess capital, which is allowing them to invest in land, right? It then in turn increases production of bigger ba barns, bigger dairy farms, dairy mm -hmm. farms et cetera. But how unusual are the Whitcombs? in the whole story of Cox, Vermont as mm -hmm. entrepreneurs. I mean, are they extraordinarily different, or were there other people doing similar kinds of things? I mean, how unusual? Yeah. I, I mean, I think there were uh, other people doing similar things. I, I, you know, I think part of the interesting thing for me is like looking at this through our current lens, right, of like, who were these people within the community? These actually were kind of the wealthy folks, right? They're, um, you know, Maybe not as wealthy as like a, a doctor or a lawyer or somebody like that in town, but they're uh, you know they got 900 acres and 100 cows and um, yeah, so presumably there are you know several folks like this in each town perhaps. Uh, but I do think that the Whitcombs are sort of a step beyond that too. Um, I mean the other interesting thing is he's obviously got a bunch of money, turn of the century, 
and he goes all in on this gravity feed, uh, pre-mechanical, pre-electrical design where out in the Midwest, and it would never work here, but there were steam engines out in the Midwest, and they were starting to, to you know, have tractor, tractors run off of steam. You needed huge wide open fields to be able to run something like that. Uh, but there was probably these, these concepts, this inkling that uh, things were headed in a more, there was a revolution, you know, agricultural revolution that was happening. And instead of sort of exploring those notions, he goes all in on this, you know, the, the Shakers had uh, built a round barn in Hancock Shaker Village in 1850. And so instead of sort of exploring where things are going to the 20th century, he goes and, and, and just goes all in on this horse powered, uh, you know, mid 19th century um, concept. So anyway, what's perhaps to explore there too. Um, the, the East Monitor Barn never had a, a cupola on it, right? Right, correct. Because okay. always the, the restored West Monitor Barn, it always struck me, isn't that a little, the whole point of the monitor is ventilation, isn't it? Like yes. A little bit like belt and suspenders, it's more ornamental. Right? It's more ornamental, yes, which most of the West Barn is. Um, the West Barn is it's shorter in length, uh, it's a little bit narrower, uh, it, the, the timber was not as superior as this barn. Uh -huh. The slate was not uh, was was the slate was uh, very inferior. Um, it was a Pennsylvania black slate? Is that what it was, Jeff? Um, yeah. And there's uh, that aerial photo from 1967. There's one just down the road of the West Barn, and you can see just massive patches of slate uh, already repaired by 1967. Uh, uh, six years later. So anyhow, um, the you know my guess is that they hired Miller to build this barn and. I, I don't know who would have built the other barn in 1904, but perhaps something that they tried to do themselves more, you know, hire somebody local to look at this other barn that Miller built, perhaps. Um, I'm, I'm guessing, kind of curious about that, because sometimes when you see barns like built, they'll, they'll often fail around the cupola because there's, you know, problems with the roof. And you'll oh, yeah. You see them, like, if that somehow helped this barn that it didn't have a, yeah. a cupola on it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yep, I think lots of... Lots of things like that. I mean, it's got large slates, um, good flashing, not a whole lot of openings like that. Mm -hmm. The monitor is a raised yep. piece yep. used in, for ventilation? Yes. So, yeah, hard to see here because we've removed everything. Uh, but there are two windows. So the window, window. This is a louvered vent that connects to the chute down below that you saw. Um, a window, another vent, window, vent, and then two windows. Um, so it offers both light and ventilation. Uh, you see, like starting, I think, turn of the 19th century, they started doing this in like a lot of factories. Um, yeah, all over sort of either monitor or like the, um, I forget what they call them, the north, north facing windows where you have like the serrated roof, sawtooth. but sawtooth, yeah. Um, just same thing to bring in uh, light and ventilation. Uh, it does a really remarkable job with that. Do you think there is? Yeah, and it's to, I mean, is it to? It's setting something sitting on top of another structure. Okay. And that's what the monitor looks like. All right. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I've been, <laughs> well, I don't know about that. <laughs> I, I've been trying to connect that one. And it's like, I, I was thinking it was more to like strictly just monitor something to be able to watch. But it, yeah, and somebody had asked before if it was related to the monitor ship. So, ah, thanks, George. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, to that point, and just, just so everyone knows, I, so that the only person I know here is, is Elliot. <laughs> My name is George Russell. I'm on the BYCC board. I've been there 10 years. Mm -hmm. And this has always been fascinating because my background is I'm an eighth generation Vermonter. Elliot is quoted uh, fixing up a, a farm that we've had in our family in New Haven, where we, it's, we have the house of 1788. We have an 1815 sheep barn, which has a lower. Oh. lower uh, uh, height because of the sheep. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm also a history major and done my history work on the early Vermont. So that's the context I have in terms of asking things about Elliot, which I could do on another day. <laughs> <laughs> but Sounds the great. ventilation that you described and going back to that Brain University of Wisconsin, mm -hmm. Rick Knopf, and I know he came here earlier to talk about this. When he first described the monitor concept, I had the idea that there were actually ventilation that came in from flues that came in below ground mm. in the fields oh. that fell, that uh, provided air for the airflow to dry the hay. Right. Yeah, there isn't that. There is, um, 
I don't know if there's an easy way to show you all, but uh, it might be here. So there's these shoots, but there's all, there are also, so in line with those, uh, there are six shoots, three on each side on the exterior of the building. Um, you might be able to see one here, but it's uh, basically a chimney that goes down from the floor of the stock level, um, down the very floor of it, and is just a contain, you know, in, two, in, a, in a stud bay, uh, and then goes out and exits through, there's an opening right here in the wall, exits the outside, and so that would suck all of the stale air out of the stock level, you know, really get air up here, and it would actually suck it down to the floor and then up through the chimney that's up in the eave. Um, so it was both, so that the drawing from AFH King shows, you know, his thing, but it doesn't show this barn, uh, which we should perhaps diagram sometime, um, because this has both this ventilation here, which is mostly exhausting for the, the hay mouse. You don't get spontaneous combustion in there, uh, but the, ven the real ventilation for the cows is actually on the eave walls. Um, so is there any other barn in Vermont that's engineered as much as this? I thought there was. I mean, there's... Um, Sarah Jane's barn, that's the Jubilee barn. Um, it's similar, but doesn't have as much of the ventilation. It has a cupola. I don't think it has any sort of ventilation shoots or anything like that. Um, yeah, I don't believe so. Yeah, and so and that's another interesting part of the story is like where did where did these things come from? Like, is this you know was Wickham exploring these ideas of, of ventilation or was that Miller? Uh, there were of course all these uh, periodicals at that point, American agriculturalist, and folks were really kind of keeping up with what each other were doing across the country. Um, so it's hard to know. But it, it, anybody who wants to help me dig in this, Mason. Uh, I think they're integral to the design. Yeah. Yeah. The same shoots that were built originally? These? All six are the same? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Only the two front ones here are still intact. So you can see this one goes all the way down. Uh, and you can actually see the doors there. So this is, you know, where there's an opening there. It used to be a doorway, board in between, doorway, board in between. And you can still see the hinges on the outside. Um, but Mason, there's a couple, yeah, there's a couple details there where like the framing is kind of built around it in a way that suggests they're probably original um, and they're part of, they're kind of part of the design. There's another, I forget exactly which it is, the, I'm not going to describe it exactly right. Um, but one of the things I was wrong about in something that the architects drew was that this vent here is off center from everything else, but it's because of that turnaround on the other side. But anyway, there's something there that suggests, yes, they are original one. Um, yeah. Okay. Do you know anything about the third monitor barn at Ooh, the Murray Farm? I do. I do. I wish I had a picture for you. Um, oh, man. Towards Jonesville. Um, I wish I... It'll take me, I wish I had this picture. Uh, it take me too long to pull the picture up for you. So there's this website. I can send it to you. Uh, so the, there's this great website of aerial photos, vintage aerial or something, that the... Um, that that 1967 one shows it. And you can literally like kind of walk down the street seeing these aerial photos. And I've heard from numerous people that there are three monitor barns. And so you go a little east to, to Murray Road and there's a four story barn there, uh, similar to this guy. And you can see off the back side there's a high drive. Uh, and you can tell that it's this, this massive four story thing. Uh, but there's no monitor. It's, it's a gable barn. I think there might be a cupola on it too, but you can see it from overhead and you can tell that there's no monitor. But my assumption is people didn't know where the name monitor came from. You know, I, I didn't know what a monitor bar barn was. They had been living there for months. My assumption is that there were these three massive barns on Route 2 and somebody just started saying, well, there's three monitor barns, a third monitor barn where. So I'm pretty sure that that, because it's right at the corner of Murray Road. Uh, I don't know that it had anything to do with the Whitcombs or Miller or anything, but I. I'm pretty sure that that is that third monitor barn. Just, you know, wasn't paying much attention to that. Yeah. That yeah, there's a little barn that's still there on Murray, and I think that the barn is actually right where Murray is now. Who built that? I don't know. Yeah. Um, the, more research. Can I do more? Monitor? It does not have a monitor. Do you know if it never did? Or it, I don't think that it ever did. I think that it's, again, I think it's just, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, I've been in touch with Devin Coleman uh, trying to figure out if there are other monitor barns elsewhere in the country because I think that this is really unique. Like, 
not just in Vermont, but in the country. But I don't know how to search monitor because I don't know that somebody in Wisconsin or Michigan is calling that a monitor barn. They might be, I don't know what they're calling it. Um, so I think that this other barn, some of you, they were calling it monitor barns just because of these giant barns in Richmond. They're monitor barns, um, not understanding that it should include that extra little gable. Um, yeah, I'll include that picture next time, though, because it's a good one. Maybe, yes, so yes. So Allison Conant was just uh, on vacation in Europe and uh, just got back, I emailed her like a couple weeks ago because uh, her husband and father-in-law stopped in here a couple months ago and Dave Conant, of course, it's probably some uh, confirming some biases or something like that, but he thought that the name Charles Miller sounded really familiar. Uh, so who knows, um, but Alice, Alice knows all about it and she's gonna get back to me. Um, yeah, that's for those of you who don't know, it's a similar barn, I think it's 1914, so it would've been a late Miller barn, but totally possible. Um, heavy, it's still timber frame, slate roof, it's like 220 feet long. Um, yeah, the Conant barn in Richmond, so right by the interstate, uh, right by exit 12 there, the long Gambrell, yeah, Iron Bridge, with the two cupolas, yep. Uh, so, but speaking, before we get too much of this, uh, just real quick, another Charles Miller barn that does exist that we know of, and there are others, um, but we've uh, probably gone over time here, but uh, this is Harrison Weller's barn, so if you remember back to the newspaper article where it talks about building Sheldon Whitcomb's barn, he's also building two 40 by 100s. This is one of those 40 by 100s. Um, so here's, oh, my arrow moved a little bit, but here's J.G. Weller here, um, which is Job Green Weller, who is the father of Harrison Weller, who's the name in that, in that newspaper article. Um, and some similarities, some similarities. Uh, Miller really liked these big long, I would call them main braces. Uh, There's a big stiffening member there. Uh, so those show up in the monitor barn, they show up in Jubilee, sort of similar, different orientations. Um, but there's just like a bunch of really geeky, sort of in the weeds details here that scream Charles Miller. Uh, this is, without boring everybody here, this will, um, so it's a it's an eave side bank barn. So the other barns we've looked at are gable end bank barns. This is built into the bank on the eave side. So the, the hillside is dug away right here because we're replacing the foundation, but it's built into the hill on the back side. And so you would come in on that back side through two uh, hay, uh, hay, uh, 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 hay cart openings, uh, hay wagon openings, and uh, so you'd bring your wagon in here, you just by hand just pitch hay over to the side, uh, be filling that up. I think that at some point they added the track there, uh, but then there's this connector, which is just really cool. That's the same picture here. So you'd have just this massive amount of hay here, but if you wanted to walk from this bay over to that same bay over on the other side, he built a little walkthrough here, a little catwalk where you could walk from one to the other through the hay mow. Um, that same detail shows up in a couple other barns, the Varney Farm in Charlotte. Um, I don't know if folks are familiar with the Varney Farm. That's one that I haven't been able to pin on Charles Miller yet, but I'm trying. Um, and a couple other Charles Miller things. Again, some neat little tidbits from Adam White. A uh, little contract here. Uh, he, had, he had ran a paint store in North Ferrisburg, and then I think uh, one in Burlington as well, once he was in his 40s and 50s. Here's a tower that was on Mount Philo, and uh, the Lawrence Memorial Library in Bristol, which still exists. And if uh, folks want to learn more about all this geeky stuff, uh, I'll be presenting again with Gene Richardson and Silas Towler uh, at the Ferrisburg Community Center on November 10th at 2. Um, and that'll be more just about Charles Miller, really. And uh, yeah, that's it. A couple last little pictures. Thanks. Thanks.